Welcome to Always Take Notes. We are thrilled to announce the publication of Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers. The book, edited by the two of us, features contributions from almost 100 past guests on the podcast. It's a distillation of the wit and wisdom we've heard over the past six years. The book offers, we think, frank and entertaining guidance on writing in particular and living a creative life in general. It answers questions such as, where do the best ideas come from? How do you stay motivated? What does it take to become a published author? And how do you actually make money from your writing? Published by Ithaca Press, Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers is available from October 12th in all good bookshops. We hope you enjoy reading it. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we speak with the novelist and screenwriter Frank Cottrell-Boyce. We spoke to Frank about his career as a screenwriter, moving from soap operas to feature films, about his work on the Olympic opening ceremony in 2012, and about his new novel, The Wonder Brothers. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. Hi, Frank. Welcome to Always Take Notes. Thanks so much for taking the time to to speak with us. We wanted to start with the new book with The Wonder Brothers. Where did the idea for this come from, and particularly this, this notion of the Blackpool Tower vanishing which sits in the book what was the point of departure for it the point of departure i don't know where to start answering this i mean the point of departure was that um through a birthday party for my mother uh who had been looking after my dad who had dementia for about five or six years and through this birthday party so she was carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders she, she was looking after him at home and i was helping as far as i could but she was you know she had a big burden we threw this birthday party for her during lockdown, so it's in the garden, and I got um, a magician to come and do close magic, which almost looked whimsically, and, um, but just, you know, what else can you do in a garden with an old lady? And uh, he did these tricks that are very straightforward, close magic, almost parlour tricks, and her face just lit up. She looked you're really young again. This woman who was carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders looked like a child again. And it really, really, really stayed with me, that. And in fact, she died about three weeks later. So if you're going to, it's like you know, completely out of the blue. She, my dad died and she died two days later. And, and she had not been ill. So it was this huge thing that happened. So I guess if you're going to psychoanalyse it, Blackpool Tower disappearing is my version of my mum vanishing. You know, something that was really solid and that had suddenly disappeared. And magic was to do with joy. And this this book is, I mean, I hope it's a really enjoyable, cracking adventure for children, but it's also thinking about joy and wonder. And I was looking at magic because I think I thought, I'd sort of lost my joy. That's a terrible thing to say because it's such a privilege to be paid to be a writer. But it was turning into a job. It was definitely turning into a job. And I thought, I'm, I'm losing the magic here. And I was also sad, you know, because my mum had died and all this. So I thought, well, how do you get magic back? I'll just look at magic. It's like really literal. I was really literal minded about it and started to, to study the history of magic and how magic worked. And I got Robbie, who was the magician that did that for my mum to come and give me some lessons. And there was so much in common between writing and magic. It's so many lessons from magic to a working writer. Um, and the biggest one being, as Robbie said, there is nothing sadder than a magician who doesn't believe in magic. Because, which is a crazy, because like it, it, it's a contradictory thing because the magician knows exactly how the magic is produced. It understands it completely. And in fact, magicians have often campaigned against the idea of magic. So Houdini was a... a, a, a a very sort of militant campaigner against the idea that there was anything supernatural in the world at all. Um, but there is that moment when it works, 
and you think, if the magician, when it works, if the magician isn't surprised as well, then it wasn't worth doing, you know? Because when you know how to do it, then you know how high the odds are stacked against getting it right. You know, so much has got to go right in a magic trick. And there's no middle ground in a magic trick. You know, it's not like sport where you think, oh, that was a good run. It's a pity the ball didn't go in the net or you ran brilliantly. What a shame you only came second. There's only absolutely amazing piece of wonder or looking like a complete idiot. So that, that sort of tightrope walk is very appealing. And I've really rambled on there and said too much, I think. But anyway, that's, I was trying to recover the wonder in my joy and wonder in my own life. So I looked at the place where the most obvious place to look for joy and wonder, which is magic. And it, it sort of gave it all back to me. It was, and I learned, I mean, we could talk all day about what, what writing and magic have in common and so how many lessons there are in, in magic for, for storytelling and how, also, how much also magic needs good storytelling, you know? Well, that was going to be my question, actually, what, what writing and magic have in common. Obviously, they both involve, involve conjuring tricks of a certain kind. Could you elaborate on what some of those lessons or similarities you learned were? Yeah, I mean, well, the, the obvious one is the fact that <laughs> it's hard work. And I think sometimes if you're a writer and you're working on your own and you have a really rotten day and you've produced very little and you don't even, when you wake up the next morning, you don't even like what, it's, what you've produced. Uh, I think you feel like a failure, but magicians know from their bones that in order to do a card flourish, they have to drop the cards on the floor accidentally like a million times in their own room. You know, they've got to stand in front of the mirror practicing these tiny things tiny, tiny, tiny things until they're perfect before sharing them with anybody else. And you forget, I think you forget that, you know, to write a PG Woodhouse sentence, you've got to write 500 sentences that are not quite PG Woodhouse. And I think that's, that's embedded in magic. You know, magicians have to practice things like picking up a coin off a table over and over and over and over and over again uh, before they before they manage to do it in such a way that you don't notice that that coin has actually gone into the other hand. And again, with, with reference to the new book, could you tell us a bit about how you come up with characters? Do you have a particular method to develop them or do they arrive fully formed in your head? I mean, sometimes they're like people around you. I mean, like, I spend a lot of time with children. You know, I've got seven children. My grandchildren are in the house every day. I go, I'm probably in a school every week. So it's usually a phrase do you, do you know what I mean? It's like usually like a catchphrase and you think, a, a phrase that a child has said and you think, oh, you are looking at the world so differently just just because of the way they've phrased something. So it's usually that uh, or, vo you know, some sort of vocabulary. So for this, like Nathan is the, the main, uh, he's not the main character because the main character is Midi, but N Nathan is this very reckless child. And that came from, talking to a teacher in a school where I've been doing a, a longer term project. This is a school for emotionally complicated children. And um, I love this school, partly because the teachers use this vocabulary that's not... People use medical vocabulary about themselves all the time now. No one's ever hungry. Everyone's over, like, hyperglycemic or something. Do you know what I mean? It's like everyone's got some kind of diagnostic vocabulary. And in this school, it's been the opposite. They sort of de-escalate everything by just using ordinary words. So, like, this particular kid is bouncy or fizzy. He's a bit fizzy. He, he can be bouncy. And I love that. So there was, there was one boy, the teacher said to me, the thing about him is, like, some people can't see number bonds. Some people can't see colours. He just can't see consequences. I thought, oh, that's so brilliant. Because uh, I know the kid in question, and he's so open to wonder himself. You know, he's so enthusiastic, but I have literally no idea. So there's this terrible incident when I'd learned to do that. I haven't got a pen. It's a very, very simple trick where you, you appear to stuff a pen up your nose and it's an optical illusion. You go, you know, and he... he <laughs> just, ram <laughs> just rammed it up there, did he? <laughs> he just stuck it up his nose. It's just like my fault. <laughs> we should say for the listeners on the podcast that Frank did actually just perform this trick on Zoom and it caused me to wince uh, considerably. So. <laughs> yeah, but it was worse for him because he didn't know it was a trick and he just stuffed his pen up his nose, so... So he was the starting point. But that's it. I mean, that's a character there right away, isn't it? And the same sort of question, I guess, for, for writing stories. Do the stories arrive in your head fully formed or do you go through and sort of map out how they're going to work on the page? I have no idea. 
I've I've definitely have no idea how they're going to end. And I think part of the joy and the pleasure of writing Wonder Brothers was I had no idea how I was going to bring the Blackpool Tower back. I literally had no clue how it was going to come back and was writing the book to find out how. And I, lo- I loved that feel. I haven't had that feeling so clearly for a long time and it was such a great... And it was like, I think that again, that's from magic, isn't it? That... that um, so one of the magicians who I name check in the book uh, is a really lovely guy whose whose signature trick is putting a cactus inside a balloon, and he had that idea of like, wouldn't it be great to put a cactus inside a balloon? I had no idea how to do it, but he decided that's what he was going to do beforehand. You know, so it's that uh, that's another lesson from magic: in, come up with something impossible and to figure out how you're going to do it later. So. I, I honestly, I was writing the last 20 pages without really knowing how it was going to come back. It was great. <laughs> we wanted to come back to the new book in due course, but could we roll back now to your early life? So growing up on Merseyside, it sounds like you were a voracious reader from a young age. And I was wondering if you could tell us about this um, very fat animal encyclopedia with very thin pages and tons of pictures. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I won, I won the Paul Hamelin. Gosh, that's amazing that you. I don't know how you got that. I I won the Paul Hamelin Animal Animal Encyclopedia, which I always tried to track down another copy of, as a prize at school. And it had, I was going to say paper thin. It had these like tissue paper thin pages. It was quite a fat book, but the pages were so thin. I don't know what the technical term is, but they were really really thin pages. So you couldn't like you you couldn't predict. Um, so I, I would, I would st- I'd be reading this like in bed for months and months and months and finding pages that I hadn't seen before. You know, I'd go and I'd be sitting in bed going, oh, my God, kinkajous. I've never come across them before. And it's like, so every page would have a different animal on it, but there were, you'd still be discovering. It was like an act of exploration uh, because the pages would stick together. So yeah, I, I'd come across pages that I hadn't seen for ages. That's a, that's a lovely memory. Thank you for that. I read as well that you loved the Moomin books. Obsessed with the Moomin books. What was it about those in particular that you liked? Well, the first thing that I loved about them, I came to fiction quite late, like a lot of boys, you know, it's like, and I think you have that, like a lot of boys, I had that spasm of thinking, oh my God, I'm going to big school, I'm going to be a grown up, and I haven't done, I'm wanting to sort of reach back into childhood. So I found these Moomin books in the library that looked like kiddie books. And I read the first one, Finn Family Moomin Troll, absolutely thrilling book, amazing, amazing pictures. She was an incredible artist. So you had this, this she does these fantastic woodcuts. Didn't know who Tove Jans- Tove- Tove Jansen was. Tove, what kind of name is that? I thought she might be a Moomin. I, th- I thought Finland was a made up country, you know, because it just seemed so convincing. You know, it seemed really convincing. I thought, well, obviously it's not real, but... I was really shocked when I found out that Finland was a real place. So I just loved that book. I thought it was fantastic. And I think what I loved about it was that the family was all in it. Like there were so many books that you read where they got rid of the parents really quickly. And it, 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 I don't know if that really bothered me. You know, not, not when it's done well, it didn't bother me. But like, say in Dahl, there was something kind of malicious about it uh, or, or kind of glorying in it, like the parents in... James the Giant Peach are killed by a rhinoceros. And your parents are never on the adventure. And the parents are very much on the adventure in the Moomin books, even though they're kind of still recognisably parents. You know, Moomin Papa is this pompous fool, really. Um, but he's also competent to a certain extent. And Moomin Mama is this... Well, Moomin Mama is the hero of those books. She's this magical creature. You know, she's got this handbag that's got everything you'd ever need in it. And it's got this amazing clarity of sight that she's got she's nothing is ever a problem to her the weirdest creatures come out of the arctic night to the door and she just offers them coffee and pine needles and i thought she was wonderful i was sort of in love with moomin mama as much as anything else and then i got the next one out which is moomin land midwinter which is like oh my god what's happened here it's like because because she wrote i mean she went back you know she wrote that after her mum died and that the, the Moomins aren't in it. And it's just like lost people hoping to find the Moomins. It was so grim. It was like, you know, it's the grimmest, grimmest book you'd ever read. But she'd written it, you know. Yeah. I mean, she, she's 
she's fantastic, isn't she? And she, what, what's amazing about her is that she, I think what's, what I found moving about Tuva Janssen is that when people write a really successful book or piece of art, they often come to hate it because it's not the success that they wanted. And it feels like a burden and they, they try to kill Sherlock Holmes or, or whatever, or Ziggy Stardust or whatever. And she didn't do that. She just put more and more of herself into it. She put like the darkest things that happened in her. She gave them, she gave you all of it to the movements. That's, you know, it's just an amazing act of generosity and wisdom. She's, she's phenomenal. Could we talk now about you, you go on to university and then your path to Living Marxism magazine. Could you tell us about how those, uh, those two particular segues came about? I mean, I don't know what the Living Marxism thing, this is so pathetic, but the Living Marxism guy used to come to the door and um, set Living Marxism at the door and asked me to write a TV column. And I said, yes, because I'm nice. That's it, really. <laughs> Did they specify that it had to be sort of suffused with Marxist ideology or not really? Well, it, well, I mean, it was, you know, because I was that who I was. I was, you know, I was already buying it. But honestly, if, if they didn't come to the door, I wouldn't have done it, which is another lesson for life. <laughs> he was a really, really nice lad who used to come to the door and sell it. And he said, we don't have a TV columnist. Would you like to do it? And it was, it was fun to write a TV column. And what were your what were your politics like at that stage? I was reading in, a, in another interview that you said that you you'd kind of I think it was reading something or, or much later that had given you a kind of reflection on your your political tribalism when you were a, a young man. Oh, really? Super tribal? You know, it was Liverpool in the nineteen eighties. The riots had just finished. You know, it was it was extremely. Tri- I mean, it's still very tribal here. You know, I but it was super tribal. So very very, very, very tribal. So my journey has been to be less tribal. Not, not to be left less a swing, but to be less tribal about it. I, I, I'm not making that point very clearly, am I? But like the, yeah, to sort of look at. Well, I mean, how substantial an answer do you want to this? <laughs> I, I think, I've I been, think re- reasonably, if you're if you're happy to. Okay, okay, well, I'll just give you a really good example. For the last seven or eight years, I've been working as a caseworker for asylum sense seekers at Asylum Link, and. I do, I'm a caseworker, but I'm a specialised one. I do family reunion. So I fill out family reunion forms, which is incredibly rewarding. You know, I bring families back together. And as it's gone on, it's it, it's become clearer and clearer to me that there's no, th- this is a problem and there's no solution to that problem because there's only two positions that you can have. You can have, you can either have asylum, refugees welcome or refugees of terrorists. And there's nobody... And, and those two positions are about I'm nice or I'm, you know, I love my country, whatever, however you want to characterise that right wing position. There's only those two positions. And those two positions are not about asylum seekers. Those two positions are about what you, what kind of person you are. And nobody is looking at asylum seekers. And I see all kinds of problems in the system, endless problems in the system that nobody's addressing because people over here are just addressing people over here and people over here addressing people over here and nobody's looking at the problem. So that kind of tribalism, which I kind of, is simple, it, it's not a kind of ideological position. To me, it's like, so that's a really pragmatic thing that there's literally nobody engaged in this. So literally the, the government has no interest in solving the problem. The, go, the government has interest in signalling to the electorate. And the, as far as I can see, the Labour Party is not that much different. You know, it's like, we're, we're nice, we're nasty, we're nice, we're nasty. And nobody's looking at the problem. So I, I try to disengage myself from tribalism because I think it hurts people. And I think it leaves people in in terrible situations. You know, like, for, for us, like, family reunion is like, you fill in two forms, you've got, a, you, can, you can't do it until you've got status. So you're, a, you're definitely, definitely a refugee. And therefore you definitely, definitely have a right to have your family. They give you, um, it takes months to collect evidence and that's fine because it should because it's fraught with all kinds of, you know, all, there's all kinds of emotional issues there. Yes, you should, should you should have to collect a lot of evidence. But then once that evidence is collected, they give you a time of three months. I haven't had anyone do it in three months for years. It's nine months minimum. And my, I've got five clients outside at the moment who are beyond a year. And that's families. You know, these are people who lost, left their families two years ago. They're, they are 
to use, you know, the, the, the most brutal vocabulary. These are legitimate refugees. You know, these are people who have been granted status and they're going to be apart from their families for three years. All the bonds are going to be broken. This, oh, like, that's a proper problem that needs to be solved. And that's not going to be solved by me saying, me standing there with a placard saying, you're welcome. You're welcome to what? You're welcome to come and simmer in a purgatory of uh, interminable indecision because we haven't spent money on, on the process. Anyway, there you go. So that's my, um, that's why it shouldn't be tribal. To return to the sort of chronology of your career, could we talk about when you started writing for soaps in the in the nineteen eighties? What was that like? It's sort of famously a challenging working environment, fast turnaround. What was your experience like working working on soaps? I, I loved it. You know, I had a great time. I had a wonderful time. Um, Brook, I started on Brookside, and nobody really knew what they were doing because it was a completely different way of making soap opera, and it felt very exciting. It felt really important. It was definitely very male in a very specific way, involving beards um, and booze. And I think it would have been a really intimidating environment for a woman. There were very few women writers on Brookie, at that time anyway. But there were very exciting people. Like, you know, Jimmy McGovern was on it, Ricky Tomlinson, Sue Johnson. You know, it was, it was a school. And I loved the speed of it. I loved not having to think, not having to look too deep inside yourself. I loved learning the technique. Uh, and I loved... Who I loved who you were writing for. You know, I loved that I was writing for my cousins and my aunties and my uncles and they would be watching it and they'd be talking about my work and that was really, really thrilling. How was it different from normal, like, soap process and stuff like that? Cor- uh, Brookie. Well, I can only compare it with Corrie, which I did ages later. It was different the way, well, Corrie was like the senior common room and Brookie was like behind the bike sheds. <laughs> Brookie was like a lot of people shouting at each other. Um, a lot of temper, a lot of incredibly bad temper, a lot of joy, uh, a lot of, you know, what about if we did this? Um, and a lot of kind of learning on the job because it, 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 technically it was shot on video and it was shot on um, a real housing estate, which is a bit very weird. Um, so the, 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 the junction with reality was very odd, whereas Coronation Street was all sets and they were kind of multi-camera. So the so if you wanted to, the sort of big technical difference was if you wrote a scene for Coronation Street and there were three or four actors in it, say a scene in the Rovers, the cameras are running from every angle. They do it once, they do it twice, they do it three times and it's done. And you kind of make your decisions in the edits. Whereas Brookie, those houses were tiny. It was an effort to get one camera in. So if you're shooting the scene with three or four cameras, you automatically you're going to shoot each of those cameras, each of those actors separately like making a movie. It's much more like making a movie. And what were the sort of economics of soap operas at that time? Was How how easy was it to make a living as a writer of soap operas? At uh, Brookside, we I, we just had our first baby and we we're very young and we were still students, in fact. And I applied for a job as a typist because this was free, everybody having their own laptop. Um, and they put everything, they had a computer called a Wang and all the scripts went into this computer. So people bought their own type scripts in. I think there was even someone who bought a handwritten script in and then they were input in. So they had need someone to input it into the word processor. And so I applied for that job and then taught myself touch typing uh, while I was waiting to hear back. Went for the interview and they went, what are you talking about? You don't want this job. I was going, no, but, and they went, look, you can, we'll give you a tryout for a script. And it was easy. It was dead easy to get on. It was very, very hard to stay on. The turnover was extraordinary. You'd go every, every month, there'd be two new faces and two old faces gone. It would be, so it was, uh, it was easy to get on, hard to stay on. It was very, very, very well paid. It was like probably the most, I've, the richest I've felt in my life, partly because I'd been a student. And I remember going out for a drink with Jimmy and a couple of others and sort of, hesitantly saying, you know, if I do get on, what do you get for a script? And they told me, and I honestly thought they were taking the piss. I thought, oh, I'm not going to fall for that. And I kind of applied for other jobs. I kept on applying for other jobs because Brookside had a repeat. And the tradition at Brookside was that you wrote, there was two episodes a week and a repeat. So I think that the money was like, it's like, it would be like 1500 for an episode. But, but they would commission two episodes off you, because you, so you would write the week's episodes, and they would be repeated on the Saturday. So for your month's work, you got 4x, you know, 
uh, it was like, that was insane. You know, being living on a student grant, it was crazy money. Um, and the best advice I ever got was from Barry Woodward, who was, a, who'd been a crime reporter. He was on Brookside and he took me aside and said, do not get used to this money. Do not get used to this money. This money is ridiculous and it's not going to last. And it didn't. And I, I went to Corrie and I think I earned a lot significantly less at Corrie than I had at Brookie. It was just a freak of the economics. So there was tons of money and it was relatively predictable. You d there, were, there were 12 writers, I think. And so in a month, four would get commissioned. So you would be on a Friday, the Friday after the story meet. There'd be story meeting on a Monday. And the Friday, you'd be sitting waiting for the phone to ring. The producer would ring. I remember Mrs. C.V. answering the phone to the producer who was Stuart. Oh, I've forgotten his surname. It's very nice, Stuart. I remember her picking up the phone and going, oh, Stuart, your voice does have so much more cachet on a Friday. <laughs> Could you tell us about how the, the move into film then began with uh, Butterfly Kiss and, and so forth? And what, did it seem like a, a natural progression from TV? No, it seemed like an enormous leap. And I loved movies. I, I mean, I love, 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 loved, still love movies. Um, on Brookside, they had, uh, they did a, t a pairing up with, um, gosh, this is so, this is, people are going to need footnotes for this, but Thames Television had an education division and they wanted to make a school, a film for schools. This is a lost world, isn't it? Isn't this, this is like saying a tapestry maker came <laughs> and commissioned something for, for the emperor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there were, they, the Thames Television, which was a ITV franchise, had an education division. They wanted to make a film for schools and they wanted to co do a collaboration with Brookside. And nobody else wanted to do it because the money was tiny by comparison. But I really wanted to do it because it was 90 minutes and it's going to be shot on film. So I agreed to do it. So I went down to Thames Television and saw, you know, film like Steenbeck's, like physical, physical film, <laughs> Steenbeck's. And the editor was um, Michael Winterbottom, who was also desperate to make a film. So that's how we met. That, that thing I did with Brookie and Thames, that had Morrissey in it. <laughs> that's so weird. Um, um, so we, we sort of teamed up then and I wrote a script you know I, I wrote a spec script and we shopped it round together and I think that's a, that's worth knowing that if there's two of you you're bringing you are bring, you're literally bringing capital to the table you know it's like I, I've learned since how hard it is to find a director um, and so he was that's how we made Buzz Blackers which was I think about a million quid which people thought was like phenomenally tiny amount of money at the time. But now, now you could probably make 10 films of that if you wanted to. I saw you say that films are easy to write, but very hard to get made. And there's always the strongest possibility that they won't get made. What made you sort of persevere with it, even though, you know, was it that early on you just had all these ideas and you wanted to do it and you hadn't yet faced, faced the difficulties of the industry? Or, yeah, what made, what made you sort of persist with filmmaking, even though it was a slightly more challenging atmosphere? I think that's such a great question. And kind of on the back foot thinking that, why, why do you persist? I mean, be, partly because I, 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 I don't think I've ever made like a really cracking movie, but, but being on a film set is so fun. And uh, yeah, it is really hard. It's really difficult to get a film made. It's a huge ask, but it, it, is, a, it is quite a thrill to see a film. Uh, and also, I think, loyalty. You know, most of the films I've made, I've made with friends. So it's like, and they've got made eventually because of friendship, you know, because despite everything, you know, uh, all the knockbacks, you stay on board because it's Danny or whoever, you know. Um, so I think loyalty is another thing. And then also, so I, when you say persist, the screenwriter doesn't have to persist that much. You know, you write the script, you send it out. Occasionally there's some sign of interest and you do some rewrites. Then it goes on the back burner again. It's not like you've spent... See, I've just made a film. I've just finished... I, I, we've just finished making a film of a, an adaptation of a Michael Morpurgo book, uh, Kensky's Kingdom. It's an animated film. And I started to work on that in 2006. But, but it's not like... It's not like I've spent those years fighting for that film to be made. 
you know, it's it's gone through all its different iterations and I've been there when it's needed my help. So it's, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's, it's not that big an ask, really. You've also spoken quite critically about these kind of traditional film writing tropes, like the three act model, the hero's journey, stuff like that. Could you, could you unpack that a bit? And then also, do you feel that the advent of streaming has, has loosened some of those shackles? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has. Oh, it definitely, definitely has. Yeah, I think, I mean, f- film writing is incredibly conservative. I mean, it's, 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 it's like down to, it's like writing sonnets. It's like, you know, here's one act, here's two acts, here's your initiated into blah, blah, blah. And it's like putting a puzzle together. And in a way that there's nothing, uh, did I say it critically? There's, not, there's nothing, uh, was I really critical about that? I, I kind of don't want to do that. And I found that writing. So for instance, I've written a lot about real people. And I, like, like I've written quite a, an unusual number of biopics. And that's partly because that gives you a free pass not to do that and to be a bit more adventurous. It, it, it's also that I, morally, fundamentally, that comes down to every problem can be solved in three acts. You know, cause that, like the, the, the magic formula for a film is someone has a difficulty. They do three acts. They don't have the difficulty anymore. And I don't think that's right and that's true. And then there's also like a slightly better one, which is someone has a problem, they fight to overcome it, they fail, but they learn to live with that. And that's kind of a sweeter one, you know? But those are the, that, that's, that's how you're supposed to write a movie. And it's not how life is, you know? So that you kind of want to try and capture something more of life. Having said which, people do magical things with that, you know? In the end, a pop song is a verse and a chorus and a verse and a chorus. And it can be... There's so many or inspiringly different pop songs that still fit to that supposedly smothering formula. You know, if you can, if you're, if you're brilliant, you can make that formula live, I think. That's certainly a salutary lesson. We wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. Thanks again for supporting Always Take Notes. Can we talk now about some of your projects in particular? So I wondered if you could tell us about God on Trial, um, which you sent over to us um, ahead of time. How did that come about and why was it a story that appealed to you? I say that because I think it's the thing I'm most proud of uh, in film and television, in drama anyway. Um, how it came about was that Mark, it didn't, it wasn't my initiative at all. It was Mark Redhead, who was the producer, who had made a film about the a trial that didn't happen, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. And he had this, in, he had in mind that it would be great to do some trials that didn't happen. So one of them was the trial of God. There's this anecdote that, um, prisoners in Auschwitz put God on trial and the, the, the anecdote runs on and they find him guilty and then they say now what do we do and they say now we pray so it's that that's a very kind of it's a parable um some people think it's based on a true story but I've come to the conclusion it wasn't um so but it appealed to me why did it appeal to me well going back to loyalty it appealed to me because I really like Mark uh, it appealed to me because um, it was a big, meaty theological subject, and I was very hesitant about it. And I'd be more hesitant now. I was very hesitant about it because I'm a Catholic, so I'm not a Jew, and because I'm a Catholic. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I probably would pass on that now. Thinking about it, but at the time that wasn't a thing, and. I went to, I mean, at the time that didn't bother me. At the time it didn't bother me so much about taking on a Jewish story as about taking on a story that seemed to involve blasphemy. So I went to speak to uh, a rabbi, Dan Konsherbach, who's an academic rabbi. And he was really, really persuasive that I should do this. And his thing was that um, 
No, he's just lovely. He just persuaded me that I should do it. And his thing was that um, Christians pray, Christian prayer, he said, basically comes down to please and thank you. Whereas Jewish prayer is like, where the fuck were you? You know, what the hell? <laughs> What's going on here? Where are you, you bastard? And if you read the Psalms, that's really true. You know, there's, it's full of anger, fury, frustration. And that kind of trial is very much in the tradition of the Psalms. So I had a fantastic time being tutored in that by an academic rabbi and then also by Jonathan Romain, who's a sort of, uh, you know, pastoral rabbi. So I got a lot of guidance and I learned such a lot and it took me to such a dark place. And I'm used to seeking out joy. You know, I'm a children's writer. My job is to find hope and happiness and to be, take a sabbatical into the land of despair was very compelling and very, very, really genuinely demanding. I felt really tested by writing that. And I'm really, really, really proud of it because I think it's just a fantastic piece of work. I can't believe I wrote it. And Mark got um, an amazing cast together. We had Anthony Shares in it, Stephen Delane's in it. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, Eddie Marsan is in it. It's just an amazing cast. You mentioned getting, uh, meeting Michael Winterbottom earlier. Could you tell us how that collaboration developed over time and then I'll t why you stopped working with him eventually as well? Oh, um, it just developed by, you know, by, by you were making one film. Michael's very kind of, uh, kind of very dialectical. So you kind of make one film and immediately want to make a different one. So he'd be stuck up a mountain in Calgary in the snow and suddenly want to make a film in Manchester or be making a film. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so it's just an ongoing conversation about what the next film would be. Um, so I just really enjoyed that. It was just like an ongoing, com just an ongoing creative conversation, really. Why did it end? I just didn't think he was ever going to make the film that I wanted to make. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, and the last thing we did together was um, an adaptation of Tristan Shandy. I think it's a bit, yes, I don't know, it was just getting a bit fractious and it kind of got rushed into, I'd always wanted to make that. That was the first film I ever pitched to anybody was Tristan Shandy because it's impossible. And when we came to do it, we did it like a Michael Winterbottom film. We did it sort of really rushed, really quick, uh, which can be very exciting. But I just thought if we could step back a bit, we could make a really great movie here. And it, it just looked like a, like a really good movie as opposed to like, you know, come on, we've been waiting 300 years to make that movie. 300 years, people are saying you can't do that. I want to do it, you know. And it just wasn't, it was never going to be that. So, I don't know, just, it just kind of ran out of steam there, really. And then you both nominated for awards for that, though, so it did turn out quite well. Or at least critics seemed to like it. Yeah, but what did they know? You know, what it could have been. It's like, it's, <laughs> I, it seems to be f really enjoyable, really funny. But to me, that's a book... I, it, and I'm really, really proud of the funny stuff that I did for that. Um, but this, it just didn't have the emotion that I think Tristan Shandy's got, which is in the end of film about a story about someone about to have a baby, trying to make the world a better place for that baby. And the baby didn't seem to... It became about filmmaking rather than parenthood. Could you tell us how the, the book writing then developed in parallel, maybe starting with Millions? And is it right that that was a film script and then Danny Boyle told you to write it up as a novel? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll never stop thanking Danny for that. Danny was my guardian angel. I, um, he came across the script from and that, that script. Of, that, you see that? You know, going back to how difficult it is, that script. I think every single director in London had read that script and said, oh, it's really great, but I can't, I can't do it. And no, the only person no one attended to was Danny Boyle because he was, you know, zombies and heroin addicts. And he came across it, I think, accidentally and said, I, I really like this. He said, he said to me, I was 30 pages in, I thought, I really want to make this film. And then when we finally met, he said, it's, it's really great up to page 30. And after that, it's just like really tears up. So we, uh, so we worked on the script together. And then we went out to dinner still remember it really clearly. We went up to dinner in, in Hope Street in Liverpool and we were talking about books. Danny is this very voracious reader and, and I'm a voracious reader too, but I was reading a lot of children's books at the time. And he kept, he kept saying like, 
you keep talking about children's books. Why have you not written a children's book? And I went, well, because I've never had an idea for one. And he went, I'm not being funny, but like two little boys find a bag of money. Pretty good idea for a kid's book. And I was like, oh my God. And I ran home and just started. And I was in a race with the movie. So I wrote that. I think I finished writing it like first week of prep. So like I finished the script as the movie was gearing up to go. So it's fantastically lucky. I mean, amazing, because I was going to casting sessions with kids. So I was like looking down the barrel of my... I think when people write about child, children's books, they often default to writing about their own childhood. But I was asking, I was like, part of my job at that point was saying to young children, what would you do with a million pounds? And that just all just went, and they, their answers just went straight into the book, you know. I was going to say, we like to get into the nuts and bolts of um, the publishing process on the podcast. So once you had written the book version of this story, was it quite easy to get an agent or get published because you had the film also ready to go? Presumably that made it quite an attractive proposition to, to publishers. Yes. I, I mean, absolutely no inhibitions about saying that. Um, I think the thing is, I think the hurdle that you had to overcome was that, is it good enough not to look like a film of the book? Because the film of the book is like, that's the lowest form of fiction, isn't it? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that like purely technically, you know. So it had to look like a book in its own right. So it was definitely, definitely an advantage that everyone knew the film was definitely coming, especially as it had Danny Boyle's name on it. I mean, I don't think anyone, any supposedly debut author has ever gone to market with that advantage, really. It was huge. Um and it was, it was uh, yeah, definitely. And I knew, I knew that I had had a, an amazing stroke of luck, but, but that also that I'd, I'd cash in on that piece of luck. You know, I hadn't let it go by me, because uh, I really like worked flat out on that book, and and I and worked hard to make it a book. You know, it it doesn't it, it doesn't read like a, a the the book of a film at all. It's a single person narrator. It had stuff in it that would never be in the film, couldn't work in the film. Um, you know, you get lots of additional material. So it was it was very much its own thing. But yeah, it was a massive advantage. And I'll never stop being grateful for that. And it's very much like the Brookside thing, that it was easy to get on. And the trick was to stay on. It's a rule of the podcast that we always ask about money and how it interacts with people's writing lives. And you talked very candidly about the sort of Brookside lavishness. How after that and going on with your career has the financial part worked and have you you know, built a, a living and a, a life with that? And how is your income now split between the different things that you do? Do you know what? I'm not really completely clear about that. Film pays really well, but the big payout is your first day of principal photography. So you, it's quite hard to account for what comes when. I get, I get really good advances for my books. So, I mean, do you, want, do you want numbers? I mean, we love numbers if you're happy to share them, but, you know, it's really up to you. I think I got 100 grand for millions. And, but that was also would have included an advance on the next book. So that's f huge by most writer standards. It's not by any means a kind of JK Rowling money, but it's colossally more than most writers would get. And in terms of film, well, the way film works is that your money, is, your, your money comes incrementally. So you get money for delivery, of, you get money for signing on, get money for first draft, get money for treatment. But the big money is your first day principle photography. So that completely depends on your film getting made. And if your film takes ages getting made, then that fee can look quite small by now. You know, like not small, but like not the glorious amount of money that you thought it was going to be. So I got, um, I got a film made the summer before last in Rome about Homeless World Cup, which I think comes out next spring. And I signed on to do that in 2009. So I think my first day of principal photography, I think my first day of principal photography for that was, I think it was a hundred grand. So that would be like everything that you got for the film. 
is that again, if you see what I mean. But that's so that that spread over from 2009 to that's what that's like that's that's the pay for 14 years work. <laughs> Delayed gratification, indeed. Um, well, thank you so much for your for your candor. I think you might be one of the only people that's been willing to share actual numbers, so we appreciate oh, it. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, well, we weren't going to disclose that beforehand. Um, some have, but anyway, we appreciate it. Um, as you do all these different projects, I know you've also written plays and you wrote the um, Olympics opening ceremony. You've said that children's novels are the other mode for you. Why is that? And could you talk sort of more generally about the status of children's fiction? You've said that, you know, people still turn their nose down on it as an artistic form. Why do you think that is? Why do I write children's fiction? Because the books that I read when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 absolutely made me. They completely made me. Those women books made me. The Wizard of Earthsea totally rewrote my brain. And, and especially the last few years, I've learned the value of happiness. And that happiness isn't a mood you know, happiness is the marshalling of resources inside yourself and that the books that you read when you're 9, 10, 11, 12 are, are a really important part of those or can be a really important part of those resources. So I want to contribute something to that. It feels really real. It feels like um, something substantial that you do with your talent. Um, and, you know, if you go to a film festival, people will say, oh, I love your work. But when you read it at school, I mean, kids will tell you things that I, I can't repeat because they're just so heartbreaking and amazing. And, um, yeah, you know, and, and, and they're confidential, you know. Um, so it just feels really real. Um, I don't moan about the lack of status. I moan about the lack of reviewing because I think it's important that kids have a choice of books. You know, I think it's really important that children read for pleasure. And you'll only read for pleasure if you can find a book that you find pleasure in. And because there's low reviewing culture, what kids are offered in Asda, which is where most of them will get books, is David Williams. And that's it, <laughs> you know, or oh, J.K. Rowling, whatever. And I, 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 I'm not one of these people who slags off David Williams at all. I don't think of him as a celebrity author. He became a celebrity by being a writer. You know, he is a writer. Um, but he's not the only, like, he's not going to fit everybody. You know, Shakespeare doesn't fit everybody. So why should, why should he? So I, I get angry about that. I don't get angry about the lack of status because it's just amusing. And um, I think maybe that's part of the power of it. I mean, if you go to Hay, it's so funny. I mean, you are on a different table. You like literally, if you go in the green room in, in Hay, the children's writers, there's like, there ain't like there's chicken nuggets. Do you know what I mean? It's like the kid, it's like the children's menu. Go over there, some chicken nuggets. I feel like there's a sitcom in that somewhere. I, 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 I so do I, but like the people that you're talking about are people like Julia Donaldson, you know, it's like fucking, that entire publishing industry is resting on those shoulders. You know, these are like billion pound turnover merchandising nation defining artists and uh, they take second place to whoever's the new favorite you know memoirist <laughs> just on that point about celebrity authors and versus authors who become celebrities we've had with other children's writers on the show we've kind of delved into this whole thing and some have have been pretty outspoken about that i mean what are your thoughts you know, about this thing where, where someone will have a profile that is from something completely unconnected with, with writing or literature and then will will produce a children's book and it will will get a lot of coverage. Um, do you think that's that's a, a sort of immutable law of the publishing universe or is it just a, a period that we're in at the moment? Oh, it's a period that we're in, isn't it? I mean, it's the long tail of Harry Potter and that sort of sense that there's money, there's a lot of money in children's books, I think. And I, 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 honestly, it's a case by case thing for me. It depends who that person is. I really hate the idea that writing a children's book, especially a picture book, which is like really hard. You know, that's to do a good picture book that, you know, chapeau, that is really, really hard. And that idea that it's sort of an accomplishment that one might take up in retirement, really, you know, you deserve two tight smacks for that one. 
you know. It, 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 so I hate that idea of it's like what's got a challenge or something. That there's something sort of genteel and nice about making a picture book. You can just fuck off with that one. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, we're coming towards the end of our time. So I wanted to ask about this um, event that you staged in Derry. Um, could you tell listeners a little bit about it and again, how that came about? I don't know, I don't know why I suggested this to you, but it was just a very, very happy time. I'd worked on the Olympics with, with Danny Boyle for a couple of years, building up to 2012. And um, I'd really, really enjoyed the idea of staging something for one night only with all the kind of adrenaline and fear and teamness that went into that. And I, I kind of fully expected to do loads more of those, but I did one the following year, which was um, in Derry. Derry was capital of UK capital of culture for a year and they wanted like a big opening night. So I worked with a group called Walk the Plank and we did this amazing thing where we bought we got a sand barge, which is a huge barge, um, to come down the foil uh, as a dragon. Uh, well, as the Loch Ness Monster. And the connection being that um, St. Saint Columba, who was from Derry, is the first person to have, record, to have made a record of encountering the Loch Ness Monster. So um, we, it was that thing of changing the story, because Derry obviously has two very different stories. Derry is where the apprentice boys closed the door and minted the phrase, no surrender. So Derry is sort of iconic in unionist culture, but it's overwhelmingly a Catholic nationalist town. And it's where the trouble started. It's where John Hume is from. So to find a story that reached across both sides of that divide was challenging and really worthwhile. And it was kind of amazing. We literally got the whole town out. Um, it was very, very emotional. Um, and, and on a practical level, getting like thousands of volunteers involved, hiding something of that scale was not easy. Uh, and keeping it secret was not easy. And that weirdness, all those sort of practical things about storytelling. Again, lots and lots of lessons that, you know, how to make people excited without giving the game away. Uh, how to get people involved. Um, and I do remember thinking, oh, right, we've got no particular starting point here. And we need, you need, it's such a tiny thing. And I don't know really why I'm sharing this with you, but we can't, it was, it was a struggle, this, and it was a huge thing. It was a physically massive undertaking. And all those problems that I've described to you, and thinking at the very, very last minute, when it comes down the river, People have no idea what, the, what they're at the river for. But we kind of managed to get people down the river through various things, down to the lock side, sorry. And thinking, oh, we need a moment because this is going to come very slowly over the water. We need a moment that says this has begun and it needs to be once upon a time. And I rang Jimmy Nesbitt, who was from, well, who'd, who'd been in Paul Greengrass's film Sunday uh, about bloody Sunday and said listen I've got a need there's no voices in this whole event there's no voices I don't want any it, it felt like a cop out to do any kind of master of ceremonies or anything like that but I need once upon a time so can you say this and I gave him like three sentences and he recorded them on his phone and sent them to me and I remember being on top of the um, the multi-story car park at the foil side seeing you know 20,000 people or whatever it was, like, you know, most of Derry on this promenade, milling about, and then this voice coming over. And it's, I, I remember seeing the audience at which, the moment at which a crowd turned into an audience and thinking, oh, this is what we do, you know? This is what storytelling is. It brings people together. You know, this moment when uh, suddenly everybody's eyes are looking in the same direction, no matter what side of the river they're from, what foot they kick with, what side of the divide they are, suddenly, and no, no matter what their mentality is or how angry they are or upset they are or happy they are or busy they are, this moment, they're all looking in the same direction. Everybody, that's what culture's for. That's what storytelling's for. And it was so 
visible. It was so visible. I was on top of the, the, the multi-story car, car park, Jimmy Nesbitt's voice, and it, like you could see this inchoate mass suddenly, poof, the discipline of listening. And it was, it was just wonder. It was amazing. As a final question for me, kind of following on on that um, live live event mode, what's your perspective on the Olympic opening ceremony from coming up, you know, 11, coming up to 12 years on, and particularly given the role of the NHS in that, all that has happened with the pandemic and the, the position that the health service is in now. And there is a, a school of thought that says that the, the kind of very cherished role that the NHS has in British public opinion is is kind of a problem, right? Because we've become blind to its faults and uh, it's not helpful to treat a public service in this sort of highly reverent way and things. What's your perspective on that, both from the time and from where we are now today? I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that take on the NHS. And that goes back to what we were saying earlier about tribalism, that, you know, you take a position on the NHS as a position on what kind of person you are, rather than a position on the NHS. Um, yes, 100%. Do I think the opening ceremony is responsible for that? No, I don't, actually. Like, you know, it's it's good to celebrate the successes as well, isn't it? You know, I think this, the, the, that affection is part of the story and it's an important part of the values. And one of the things the NHS does is unite us. So that I, I kind of don't feel any regret about doing that. I do. I know what you're asking, and I think it's partly that that event, which was supposed to be a one night only event, has become this kind of landmark for a lost Britain. Like a, a sort of pre Brexit, pre, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what people leave out of the picture when they say that is that um, that was not uncontested, that event. Everyone said it was going to be shit, <laughs> you know? Everybody said it was going to be shit. We pulled something out of the bag there. And, you know, people were not on side with that. Everybody said it was going to be terrible. And we made something amazing. So, it, and it, do you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, that's not what people's view of Britain, that's not a picture of what Britain was like. That's a picture of what Britain could be. That's a vision of how things could, might be. That's not a vision of how things were. It's interesting, actually, I was, I was thinking she was saying that with, with Tina Brown, so we had on the podcast a while ago. I think she, in, actually in a chapter in her Harry and Meghan book, explicitly references it as like the high watermark of post-war Britain and everything like that. But it, it wasn't, though. <laughs> it's like, it's, it, I mean, it's the field of the cloth of gold, isn't it? It's like, this is what Henry could be. It's not the field of the cloth of gold's fault that Henry turned out to be. A shit, you know. I don't know if that's where we should wrap up the interview, but we have uh, we have come to the end of our time. Um, oh no, that's such a bad note to go out on. <laughs> well, that. Um, finally, well, I'll, I'll end with what are your future plans and um, what are some of the projects you hope to pursue in the coming years, I guess? I, I just want to carry on writing children's books. Really, I do, you know. And film, I kind of wait till film comes to me. Um, I've got two films that are not out yet. So immediately before a film comes out, you have a little moment of heat. So see if something happens there. But I children's books are, are where I'm at, really. And that's what I want to carry on doing. And the work that I do in schools. You know, I'm building uh, with Simon O'Brien, who I worked with on Brookside, who was on Brookside when I was on Brookside. The two of us are physically building a library in the school that my dad went to. And that, well, it's not the school my dad went to, but it's the nearest school to where my dad went to school. And it's also the nearest school to where I went to school. It was in a really hard, tough part of Liverpool. So we're building a library there. And we're hoping to make that one of several libraries. So that's that's one project. Great. Well, look, thank you for a fascinating and wide-ranging uh, conversation. And best of luck with that library project and also all your other ventures going forward. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Frank Cottrell Boyce. You can find him on Twitter at Frank Cottrell underscore B and on Instagram at Frank underscore Cottrell underscore Boyce. And The Wonder Brothers is published by Macmillan Children's Books. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway from the interview with Frank? 
I found Frank to be a, a warm and funny interviewee. Uh, he took my probing about his financial affairs with uh, good humour. Um, I enjoyed his observations of the process of books to film and film to books. And I thought it was interesting as well that um, there are some projects that he probably wouldn't take on now, which I think shows this different climate um, for writers today. Uh, how about you? I was really interested to hear about his work uh, writing for soaps, actually, because I've wanted to have someone from that world on the podcast before and haven't. And it was a kind of fascinating insight into you know how the sausage is made in a world that I I really didn't know. And was also yeah interested to to probe him on um, the Olympics stuff from from about ten years ago as well. But yeah, he was a, he was a kind of gracious man, so good to have him on. Um, anyway, Rachel, what have uh, what have you been up to? I have been, as I said to someone recently, I was like, I've just been gallivanting between England and France. Um, I've just come back from my... Uh, like a medieval king. Uh, if only. <laughs> so if I sound a bit hoarse, it's because I've just come back from my Hindu, where I did probably about 12 hours of karaoke uh, over three days. <laughs> what, what is your preferred karaoke number, Rachel? Um, I woke up everyone singing Waterloo by ABBA, which I'm sure was lovely. Um, uh, so yeah, it's normally ABBA. Um, what's your karaoke song, Simon? I don't I don't have one, although um, my girlfriend is Korean, where, where karaoke is sort of the national sport, so they're, they're, they're keen on it. But I, I would have wondered whether you, you would extend to, um, to Harry Styles as well, Rachel, because he's also a point of reference in your life. He is. I'm sure I have done quite a lot of Harry Styles songs, One Direction also. Um, in terms of things I've been reading, I am reading Gates Lisa's book, a uh, recent book called Bartleby and Me, which is looking back over his career and some of the stories and people that he's profiled. Um, and I've also been reading Adam Sisman's new book about John le Carre, the subject of a future interview. So I won't say too much about that. Um, how about you? I was thinking we should, we should try and get Gates Lisa on the show, actually. Um, I, would, I would love to have him on. So I have been away on holiday, actually. I was in the west coast of Ireland, which was glorious. And uh, in a kind of overlay of uh, geographical place and cultural intake, I watched The Banshees of Inner Sharon, which I, I really enjoyed, very kind of darkly humorous. I'm a big fan of Martin Madonna and have been since I saw the Lieutenant of Inishmore when I was a teenager, actually. And then I also um, used the opportunity of, of being away on holiday to do some reading that wasn't related to stuff I'm writing, which was a, a pleasure, really. So I... Uh, I read three books. So I read a John le Carre novel, again, as as prep for uh, this interview with um, Adam Sisman that we've got coming up. Uh, and I found it slightly disappointing, which I felt was, was you know, there's a time in a man's life when you realise that James Bond films are a bit silly. I think there may be like a later point when you realise that le Carre novels are a bit, you know, and not quite all they're cracked up to be. But so that was a bit sad. But then I read um, Sam Knight's book, past podcast guest, The Premonitions Bureau, which I enjoyed. And then I also read another um, book by a past podcast guest, um, Out of Sheer Rage by Jeff Dyer. So I've been kind of delving a bit into our back catalogue, which has been fun. And then on the um, on the multilingual podcast beat, I also found a new one, a new German podcast from Zeit, uh, which features a, a German and a Swiss person and an Austrian all speaking together. And so it's good for one's accents, which is um, an important part of learning German. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Acom. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. And our score is by Jess Danheiser. And our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Instagram at Always Take Notes. We're on Twitter at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.